A very warm welcome to all of you. This is Distinguished Lecture Series by prominent professors around the world, brought to you live by Faculty of Engineering, University of Technology, Malaysia. And again, you are with me, Malavili Balakrishnan, anchoring the show for this morning. Today, we are very lucky to have a very influential and prestigious person in the field of biomedical engineering, a role model, a mentor, and a giant in biomedical engineering, electrical engineering, and neurology, Professor Nitish Thakur. Professor Nitish Thakur will give us a talk on brain-machine interface basics to applications. Let me now leave the floor to Professor Dr. Muhammad Rafiq Abdul Kadir, the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, to welcome our distinguished professor. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, Mala, for sharing the session. Assalamualaikum. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our 42nd UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq, and I am the Dean of Engineering, University Technology, Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Nitish Thakur from Johns Hopkins University, USA. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Nitish Thakur served on the Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science of the Northwestern University from 1981 to 1983. And since then, he has been with the John Hopkins University School of Medicine, where he is currently serving as a professor of biomedical engineering. He conducts research on neurological instrumentation, biomedical signal processing, micro and nanotechnologies, neural prosthesis, clinical applications of neural and rehabilitation technologies and brain machine interface. He has authored more than 250 peer reviewed publications on these subjects. He was the editor in chief of IEEE transactions on neural and rehabilitation engineering and presently of the medical and biological engineering and computing journal. Currently, Dr. Thakur directs the Laboratory for Neuroengineering and is also the director of the NIH Training Grant on Neuroengineering. One of his current research projects, in collaboration with a multi-university consortium funded by DARPA, is to develop a next-generation neurally controlled upper limb prosthesis. He is actively engaged in developing international scientific programs, collaborative exchanges, tutorials and conferences in the field of biomedical engineering. So that is a brief biography of our distinguished speaker. Here now is Professor Nitish Thakur from John Hopkins University, USA to talk about brain machine interface basics to applications. Professor Nitish Thakur, over to you. Okay, well, good morning everyone there in Malaysia and other places. I am now uh, switching to my presentation. So I should actually, give a little extra introduction. I, for last seven, eight years, I'm also affiliated with National University of Singapore, your neighbors. And I've had the pleasure of visiting Johor Bahru and give a talk a few years ago. And so in good days, I used to spend a lot of time in Singapore and now, and sometimes come to US. And nowadays, because of the pandemic, I'm not able to go back, so I'm, calling you and talking to you from the United States. I hope uh, all of you are safe and I hope you will take care and I hope we will be able to meet soon. Okay, so I want to now present this field of brain machine interface. I feel that I can give a little bit of introduction and some exciting examples of what I do and my colleagues and our team and then some glimpse of the future. I really will be very happy to answer any questions you may have, okay? So please don't hesitate. Okay, so let me just sort of give a bit of an outline. Um, you know, first of all, brain machine interface is a topic within biomedical engineering or even neuroengineering. So I want to tell you what is neuroengineering. And then I want to tell you about brain machine interface and I will tell you about my work in neuroprosthetics, brain control of processes. And then I want to give you some glimpse of the future, okay? All right, so how do I explain and tell you all about neuroengineering? So interestingly, it's a very big, very large, exciting field. And I want to 
summarize that by showing you this table of contents of a handbook that I'm editing. It will be published next year by Springer, but it has 15 sections, more than 100 chapters, and will be almost 3,000 pages. So it has many topics. How do you interface to the brain, building the devices and sensors, circuits, but a very relevant topic is neural processes, brain-machine interface. There are many other topics, such as rehabilitation, robotics, signal processing, imaging, and clinical and translation. But of course, today, our topic of interest is brain-machine interface and neuroprosthetics. So I hope you get a big picture, and now we go a little bit more specific. Now, you know, biomedical engineering has been at the forefront. Many people know about cardiac pacemaker and defibrillator. Increasingly, people know about things like cochlear implant for hearing, and even now deep brain stimulation to treat diseases like Parkinson's. So this, what you see in the circle is that biomedical engineering and its success. Now, interestingly, when I was a young student, and I hope there are many students in the room, uh, attending, the hot area in those days was cardiac pacemaker and defibrillator. I did my PhD on that. Today, the hot area is neuroengineering, deep brain stimulation, and even brain machine interface. Okay, so let's take some examples. What are these neurotechnologies? I already told you about cochlear implant for hearing, uh, deep brain stimulation to treat Parkinson's, uh, retinal processes to give you vision. This was received FDA approval only a few years ago. And now I circle this topic, neuroprosthetics. There are many other areas we can, nervous system is not just the brain, it is spinal cord, it's nerves, and neuroengineering is applicable to that as well. All right, so therefore, what is neuroengineering? So I define that as engineering to solve problems make discoveries and translate inventions in, in neurosciences, both basic and clinical. This is where engineers play a role to promote and advance basic science and clinical applications. So let's go into brain machine interface. So when we want to build a brain machine interface, what is the purpose? For clinically, the purpose is that we may be interested in the diagnostics. Anything connected to the brain records brain waves, and from that, we can reach some diagnosis. There is other area called neurotherapeutics, where we treat brain disease and disorder. In fact, deep brain stimulation of Parkinson is an example devices that record and stimulate the brain for epilepsy is a good example. But as I said, it's not just the brain. You can have brain, you can have spinal cord, and you can have nerves. So spinal cord injury can be now treated by restoring by electrical stimulation to achieve function of the lower body, which is otherwise disabled. And even more recently in the near last several years, Many attempts are made to connect to the periphery so that we can work and establish connections in the broken nerves to restore limb function and other organ function. So brain-machine interface, for sure, is the interface to the brain, but it can be generalized to the rest of the nervous system. Okay, why would we do that? Well, there are many diseases and disorders. The pioneering work related to brain-machine interface was done for disease like ALS. ALS locks a person in the body without any ability to move anything at all. And the only way we can communicate is by direct interface of the brain. Of course, brain can be damaged because of stroke and there will be value of building a brain-machine interface. Similarly, spinal cord paralysis, but also pain can be modulated via spinal cord. And then periphery is nerve injury, restoration, and regeneration. 
Our focus today still will be mostly on brain because I cannot cover all the topics. So I will mostly discuss brain machine interface. So it's a little simple tutorial right now about what are we connecting to the brain? Well, if you look at it, this is of course the whole brain and we can put electrodes on the scalp and record the brain waves, they are called EEG, electroencephalogram, which is fine. The problem is the brain has like 80 billion neurons and a few electrodes on the scalp are not very precise and do not record very good signals. Therefore, sometimes it's advantageous to put electrodes on the brain directly, subdurally as it's called, then you can get a little better, more refined signal called ECOG, electrocorticogram. That's another way to build a brain mesh interface. And for the most precision, high resolution interface, we put micro electrodes in the brain. Now, when we put micro electrodes in the brain, they record what are called spikes or action potentials from individual neurons or a group of neurons. So we have many different ways of connecting to the brain and capturing the message of the brain, right? We want to build the brain machine interface. So we want to get its message. So EEG is like using a microphone and listening to a whole crowd. It's noisy. You cannot very precisely pick up any one person while spikes or micro electric recording is like putting microphone on one person and get a very precise understanding. But as you saw, these things are invasive versus EEG is non-invasive. So of course it's better and more convenient for that reason. So now what is the basic of brain computer or brain machine interface? Well, it's a means to create a communication without movement. I mean, if I can move my hand, I can speak, there are many ways to communicate. But if I cannot do that because of the disease like ALS or when somebody is paralyzed and so on, may need brain computer interface or brain machine interface. And one of the basic idea is that instead of movement, you imagine a movement. So when you imagine that movement, actually brain acts on it and actually it produces a special brain signal that we can then use to command a computer or a machine. There are different types of signal. There's something called P300, it's an evoked response. This is also when you pay a selective attention, it changes its signal and therefore say, okay, I'm paying attention to my name, Nitesh. Then there's a change in that brain signal and therefore I can use it as a command for the computer. Now, you know, brain computer interface, brain machine interface has so many exciting applications, but it's also a lot of hype. You know, it is definitely not a way to read the mind. I mean, people say that kind of happily, it's like reading the mind. No, we are not there. I mean, it's like if I put a microphone in a big concert, I'm not reading somebody, every person's what they are saying. So we are not at all there. Similarly, it doesn't write into the brain. Now we can stimulate the brain and we can influence it, but we're not there yet. We don't have an artificial brain like prosthetics. We are not there yet. So, you know, so there are many things we cannot do, but few things like medical EEG, marketing, just other things we are quite capable of doing. So brain machine interface is a new field. It is making progress, but there's a lot of hype. So you have to be careful. Okay, so let me give you a bit basic architecture. So it's a little complex figure. So let's go step by step, right? So the first step is that we must record the brain waves. Of course, this is done using a cap or a sensors that are on the head. So there are different kinds of subjects, as we said, and we can put the cap on them to pick up, put the sensors on the scalp and we record the brain waves. We acquire the data. We process that information. We do a lot of digital signal processing. We do a lot of machine intelligence, a lot of machine learning, so that 
classification and separation of the complex message of the brain can be decoded. So this is where, of course, the, the key research, key developments are, the algorithms, the signal processing and machine learning methods that do this. And a classifier, like, do I want to do move my arm? Do I want to move my leg? Do I not do it? Or do I want to stand up? There are simple things and more advanced things will be like speech. So that is because if we can classify the brain waves. And then more recently, we have interest in giving even the feedback so that we can give the person the feedback of their brain command. So as I said, it works by controlling your mental activity. Imagine the movement, imagine the emotion. There are certain tasks which influence the brain wave, and then those brain waves are decoded. So here is a picture where a student is wearing the brain cap. First, we have to find out where in the brain something is happening. We do feature extraction, we do classification, and from that, we decide command. So if you look at this colorful picture, you see that at time zero, the student says, I want to control a prosthetic arm and I want to open it. So when he does that, the spectrum of the brain wave changes. You see the blue color. It tells it that some frequency, there's something frequencies called mu band, around 10 to 15 hertz, it changes. And that is a command to the brain wave. So let's see how that works. Here is, let, I'll play a video. So now, you know, a, a, a student is, you'll see the student varying the brain cap and is controlling the robotic or prosthetic hand. So you see here that this red thing is a cloth cap, the white dots are the electrodes on the brain surface. On his arm is the brain rec wave recording amplifier with wireless. And then the, there's a computer that's processing the information. And that processing that I showed you in the previous picture leads to this command to open and close the hand. So here it is. Now what you realize that the student has to be quiet, it's slow, but this is something we did about 15 years ago. So it's a relatively old technology, but you can see that it's effective. If somebody is very quite paralyzed, of course, you can imagine this is so useful. Now, let's go forward. What is our journey? We, what are different things we did? So here, the, like a large consortium a team put together, we have a organization affiliated with the University called Applied Physics Lab. They led the large initiative and here, this person has a arm that's amputated. So the brain connection to the spinal cord, to the nerve is connected here on the chest. And then the idea is that he will be controlling his arm. So now you see that he is able to fully control his robotic arm, elbow, shoulder, wrist, because we are, in this case, decoding the signal from the brain to the nerves to the muscle. And then you decode that to achieve different types of classification. So this is progress. This was demonstrated seven, eight years ago. So a little bit about machine learning and classification, right? Our job is to classify different movements like open, close, and so on. So this circle here on the upper left shows the problem of classification. On the right side, what you see are different types of waveforms. So you need to develop some neural network model. In the many years ago, we were doing recurrent neural network for this kind of classical application and we can decode that information. Nowadays, many deep learning neural network are highly applicable because through very deep high level convolutional network with different step-by-step -step or what I call max pooling and upsampling, you can train many layers of neural network. 
And amazingly, that classification is quite a bit more accurate than many other machine learning techniques. And that's why no wonder it's become very popular. So let's take some example. In this case, it's a video animation that it is a down to being able to classify individual fingers. Remember before we were classifying the whole open and close, but now you see that hand with its individual finger is being classified. So that specificity has gone up. The speed has gone up because of this use of deep learning techniques. I'm, I'm trying to advance the slides, please. Yes. Um, OK, so let's go back to this brain machine interface. The example I gave you, the, let's be more specific. How about if we put electrodes in the brain? And so this is, I give you example, because this research is going on in many universities. Uh, there is a very nice, impressive work that was a team led by Brown University and uh, many other members of that consortium. And here, the subject who is paralyzed has electrodes implanted in the brain. So you can really see it a little bit. It's very difficult to see those micro electrodes, obviously. But then the decoding is done from individual neurons so that now this woman is, going, is able to control this robotic arm with control of the individual neurons. This is a similarly another project done at University of Pittsburgh. But now, Index. interestingly, there's a robotic hand as individual finger. What and you're this seeing person as the trials take place is that as the researcher applies light pressure to the robotic fingers, mm -hmm. those physical sensations are converted into electrical signals that are fed directly back into Nathan's brain. Through this brain-machine interface, electrical signals are delivered as precise stimulation that his brain interprets as though his own fingers are being touched. Index. Index. Ring. Despite being blindfolded, Nathan can identify with nearly 100% accuracy Pinky. which fingers on the robotic hand are being touched. So you see that the field has advanced <clears throat> And then particularly when you do implantation, you can achieve very precise movement, even precise sensations for the subject. Let's come back to Johns Hopkins. And this is now very recent. The team has now demonstrated that you can control two arms. So that means that here you see the two very few futuristic, very high-tech arms with fingers and wrist and control. And this is a virtual reality screen where the subject will manipulate. And you can see that he's able to, he's wearing all those that micro electrodes on his head and those brain signals are being decoded to control each individual arm. And he is now through his thoughts moving the arms to the individual object, but not both of them, because remember, you see he has two sensor arrays or even more sometimes so that they can each connect to the brain area for the left arm or the right arm and sensory part of it. Of course, this is quite amazing, isn't it? You can see this incredible robotic arm being moved. Of course, the brain interface is there with all the microelectrodes and microelectronics. As Francesca Tanner was one of my former students and Matt Pfeiffer and the whole team, Luke Cosborn is a recent PhD from our lab. And they've done all this incredible work to put together the entire system that works together to decode and control the brain machine interface. Okay, so what are the take home messages? This advancement occurred because there's a grand challenge. Build the brain machine interface, revolutionize prosthetics. And that challenge captured the imagination of a lot of people. Of course, there was a lot of funding. 
there was a large, large team effort to create an intense technological push to do many things, brain machine, the very advanced prosthetics, machine learning and decoding. It was also a multi-institutional effort and teamwork. But the very important now point is that it takes a lot of extra work to translate this basic research into practice to an MPT or a person who needs it into a clinic involving now surgeons and clinical team as well. So it's not just about writing papers, but converting technology for practice. So that's an important take home message. We can discuss it if when you have questions. Okay, so I want to tell you now a little bit about some of the frontiers. So mostly as you see, this is about brain to machine, which means you have a thought, that thought is decoded, the control is given to the limb. Now you move this artificial limb. But what is next, right? Sensory side of it. When a person moves, can we take the sensory information back to the person, to their brain? So that sensory feedback is equally important. What we call closing the loop. So this would be what is called bi-directional interface. It involves everything, right? When we move the arm to grab an object, we see our eyes are involved. Our movement, so we have a sense of position, our motor system, movement is involved, sensory system is involved. So we will need this very advanced machine learning algorithm. And these little dots are these record from hundreds and thousands of neurons to build this whole closed loop, bi-directional brain machine interface. You know, it reminds me when I was a student and uh, when I was young, I, I was interested in this field because I, like many young people, you go and see a movie. This is Star Wars. And in Star Wars, Luke Skywalker's arm was cut by his father in that laser fight. And then they gave it, this artificial arm, but its artificial arm is able to sense, it's able to feel. So that was the movie 30 years ago. Okay, so what is the reality now? So to do that, we must mimic the sensory system, right? The skin, we must decode and these spikes, the sensors in the skin, then again, use some kind of a spiking neural network to interpret that information. So as, a, as in this video, if I, if I touch my skin, the sound you're hearing is that of those receptors, the neurons in the skin. They're encoding for the sense of touch. If I play this video further, you can see that these receptors, the sensors are picking up the sense of touch, the pressure, the force. This blue and red are the spikes. And for different objects, you, you see that there are different types of responses, like for sharp objects. So, and that is how we, we can interface this touch and force pressure to neural activity. OK, so if now we put it in a prosthetic hand, like a skin, we call it edermis. Then when you touch the skin, this is the soft skin, when you touch it, this red and black colors you see are the sensor signal that a person is getting a sense of touch, that feeling. So that's a technique called neuromorphic encoding. It's sort of bio-inspired, neuro-inspired touch. And so that's why, come on, let's go back to this. We saw this video, that person wearing two. Um, some of the, I mean, we've, I felt anywhere from and some of it's hard to explain what it really feels like. Like some of it is a pulse. Uh, like I said, it kind of feels like we do the blood pressure. The other one is um, the actual pressure where it feels like somebody's grabbing your hand or your finger. Um, some of those are pins and needles, like when your arm falls asleep type thing. So, you know, the, 
by stimulating the brain, there are many different sensations that are achieved. And this is happening now. So this is the frontiers of this topic. Who knows how many different things we'll be able to decode and encode. But uh, we will be discovering this. I want to give one a last example from our lab. This is work by one of my PhDs from Lucas Bon and, uh, and a team. So can you even actually feel something like, not just touch, but even pain? So here's one of my graduate students who is himself, uh, George was an amputee, is wearing this prosthetic hand, is able to control the hand. He gets a sense of touch and through stimulation he even gets a feedback and he picks up these different objects as you can see. But now let's move the, the objects to a, sh a sharper object, okay? So when he now touches a sharper object, actually like a pin, you know, you should feel pain. And in fact, that's what happens to him. See, he, he pushes back because he feels that reflex. He feels that pain. And therefore, now we are able to even convey a sense of not touch, but also the sense of pain. I think that is a very big step by this work by the student. So I think we are making very good advancements in this topic. And so, Let's go even further. What are the even further frontiers, right? So what are many people doing? In fact, we ran a IEEE workshop only a few weeks ago in July. Again, it was like this remote uh, because we couldn't go to the conference which was supposed to be in Montreal. And we invited different researchers who talked about sensory brain machine interface, motor, bidirectional and cognitive. Because I don't have so much time, I just want to give you some examples, one or two examples each. Here is an example of sensory. So this is work done by Silvestro Michera and his group at EPFL in Switzerland. So here is the person who is an amputee, is controlling the prosthetic hand, but he's also doing a very good manipulation of the objects because he can feel it, so he can grasp the object very well. And in fact, their vision is very interesting that some point, see all the electronics, everything is carried by the person on his backpack. See, as an artificial arm, all of this, it's as if it's like he's working on this every day. So the prosthetic arm is dexterous, it's being manipulated and it's being controlled. It may be that person will be able to even drive as you are starting to see in that picture. This is work by Stanislav Povich, but he's exploring, can we provide sensory information via the leg? Because people also lose the lower limb. And in this situation, they are touching his leg and the subject says, yes, I feel it here or I feel it there. So, you know, he's able to precisely localize where he is feeling that sense of touch. So even our leg has sensation and it will be very useful for lower limb amputees. Some example of motor I already gave you. This is work by Jennifer Collinger at uh, Pittsburgh and I think I showed you, but here she's controlling in a spinal cord injury, the team, that the person is able to pick up different objects, control the grasp force and manipulate it. In, initially the training is done in virtual reality and then you bring it in real system and build this closed loop system for brain machine interface. This is a work by Pepe Contreras at University of Houston. He again works on lower limb for paralyzed individuals. This person is wearing the EG cap and has a whole exoskeleton and he's trying to walk. So the exoskeleton is empowered to walk and the brain machine interface can do the start and the stop. Again, we have a, this is just the beginning, right? We don't have the full real time detailed control, but again, there's a, some research going on in the area of 
brain machine interface for lower limb amputation or paralysis. And this is a good example. By the way, this is non-invasive. So as I've said before, non-invasive has some practical advantage because it doesn't require surgery. Even frontier is something like cognition. By stimulating in closed loop, can you control emotions, memory, and full spinal cord function? I will skip it in interest of time, but I want to show some examples from our work uh, group's work on uh, interpreting this information to produce the pictures of the brain waves during that type of an activity. You, I showed you that when the subject is wearing the brain cap to control the brain machine interface, and we give sensory information. Here is these brain waves, they, they change. They change and localize where the feeling is, right? So you see that we are touching his finger, touching his thumb and the brain in somatosensory cortex is picking it up. It's quite amazing. So the, we, we now have an understanding of where these activities are being processed in the brain. Okay, so there is, what are the take home messages from the workshop? One is that now we should close the loop. It's not just motor, it's not just sensory. We must close the loop, feedback. We need a lot of computational work, uh, computational model, machine learning. Now you see that we need implantable system. We need to translate all these ideas to take from research laboratory to patients and bedside. So. These are very important messages to take home. So I just want to recap things I've presented. One is that brain machine interface is useful for neuro restoration to even augmentation. Someday we will be able to improve the motor performance, sensory, even memory and learning. So of course, today I showed you about motor process and sensory, but we hope and of course, there's ongoing research on pain modulation, treatment of different diseases. And of course, only not just brain, but spinal cord and periphery. That's one point of the recap. Second point of the recap is that we must focus on neuromuscular interface, spinal cord interface, peripheral nerve interface, and not just prosthetics. That's what I presented, but there are many brain disorders and injuries that we have to address. Third message is that solution need, need reach daily life, right? We saw that this person walking around with the interface, in this case, the person is able to walk with the brain machine interface. So we want to not just keep it in the laboratory, but take it out in real life. And of course, you can have a lot of questions because it's going to take a lot of work by big teams and then industry participation to make it happen. So to recap, I showed you this picture before. Now I hope you are, you appreciate the advances being made in the field of neuroengineering. It's revolutionizing medicine. And among the many topics, an interesting and important topic is the brain machine interface and neuroprocesses. So I want to stop here because of course I can some give you some glimpse into the future, but my thought is that let me answer some questions. Uh, if time permits, I can give you a few little bit more message about, you know, uh, moving forward in this area. Uh, what can we do in future? Okay, so I hope uh, we can take some questions. And then if time permits, I will tell you about my glimpse into the future. So I'm now seeing some questions. So I will take the first question that I have. The person says it's amazing presentation. Generally, what is the level of accuracy of the artificial hand? How reliable it is in handling false signals and sensory messages? And I think this is a very intelligent question. It's really intelligent question because all these things look beautiful, but in reality, that is 
the challenge. You know, any cutting edge technology, it takes a lot of time, right? It does not work right away and immediately. And in this case, the signals from the brain are noisy. So there are a lot of false detection, false error. Uh, mainly today, the problem we find is it's also quite slow. We cannot decode things so rapidly and we cannot classify many action. You know, even now I'm moving my arms, moving my hands and fingers and everything is happening very quickly. And in reality, you saw that the person was walking very slowly hand and fingers were like open and close and individual fingers. So we have a lot of challenges ahead of us. I want to take a few more uh, different questions. Uh, um, for subdural electrodes, how often does electrode need to be changed? And how do you manage the risks of infection? Fantastic question, right? Because anything implanted, first of all, it's a brain surgery. So it's risky, expensive, and so on. But actually, surgeons can do the safely. But this question is very intelligent. So the limiting factor is not at the moment just the surgery. It's that those electrodes, microelectrodes, don't last a long time. Secondly, the brain doesn't like it. So there's scarring occurs, something called gliosis. That scarring limits and perhaps potentially create a small micro damage. In monkeys, in that kind of research, they've shown you can keep it for one year, two years, four years. In patients also, there is some experience of going up to one or two years. But you know, you look back to things like artificial pacemaker, artificial heart, same thing happened. And high quality engineering, good quality surgery solved that problem little by little over the years. There's a question, are the brain implants permanent? <sighs> Unfortunately not, for all these reasons, these electrodes fail, electronics, the decoding algorithms then don't work as well after a while because the brain is adaptive and plastic so uh, for now, there is a kind of a limitation to being able to do that. But there is a, yes, of course, there's anything you do, there's a risk of inf infection or certain uh, scarring and so on. But surgeons have learned good practices to be able to do that as well. So I hope I have answered some of the questions. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for an interesting talk. And it was very, um, uh, as, as, the, as the topic goes from basics to application, we could understand the basic principles behind the brain computer interface. And then you showed us very interesting um, applications. And uh, now we have another question from um, Dr. Ahmad Zuri. Are the brain implants permanent? I, I believe you can see the question as well. Yes. So, so I think that right now the duration is about one to two years, but we just don't know we don't have that long-term history or experience. As I said, in monkeys, it may be about two to four years has been shown, but there's a degradation of performance. In humans, that kind of experience is one to two years. And I think it's just cutting edge, so we just don't know how long. I should remind you that there is a parallel attack uh, from uh, non-invasive approaches, and there's a lot of pioneering research has been uh, sponsored to go non-invasive and there is a parallel research to do invasive and for non-invasive the issue will not be how long it's just a more question of how do you make it so convenient you know like an implantable pacemaker you implant and forget about it for 15 years so i think that that may be one important answer but if we can do anything non-invasively of course it's much better okay thank you Thank you, Prof, for that answer. I think that gives us a clear picture. Um, and uh, any more questions? We had uh, three questions from the audience. If, if there is no question, I have a few questions for you. Prof, we have heard of Professor. That is very common. But we know that you are a provost. Am I pronouncing it correctly? Is it no, 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 I'm not a provost. Uh, in Singapore, they gave me a title of provost chair professor when I started to set up the institute. So I was a director of a research institute called Singapore Institute for Neurotechnology. Ha, so it's a title awarded to you for your contributions and your uh, knowledge in the field of neurotechnology. Is that right? 
yes to help to uh, set to set up the institute there yes okay okay congratulations and thank you very much prof maybe another question is um uh regarding the future okay uh the the other audiences had question technical questions so mine would be just a general question like uh, what is the future where is this um uh, brain computer interface and neurophysiology uh, and all this uh, technology regarding brain leading to you have any answer for this can i show you some slides that we yes, you know, sure. have a little bit of time and let me show you this glimpse into the future all right so <laughs> Many times, if there are young people in the audience, say, go and see the movies. You know, sometimes for me, like Star Wars and after 30 years, it's a reality. So similarly, you see these movies like Matrix and X-Men and so on. And there is always some of these animation of brain and control and connection. You've seen it in Matrix here in X-Men, right? And sometimes you think like, is that the future? Of course, in the movies, they make it very dramatic and there's connections are crazy, but I think that's a science fiction question. So the question is, how do you make it real? And the United States has a really great opportunity because of many agencies like DARPA, which is the agency called Defense Research Agency, sponsors this kind of research. So here is one of the things, something called brainstorms. It's a way to using magnetoelectric signals so they don't have to make it invasive, right? So that is the kind of thing, or injectable. So you can inject into the uh, nerves so that you can record and write through micro injection of nano electronics, micro electronics. So that's the kind of one of those high tech future. We shouldn't be just thinking about movement and all of that. There are neuropsychiatric illness like depression that can be treated through these kind of uh, connections to the brain. Um, other things are things like plasticity and cognition, right? So by targeting areas of the brain called hippocampus and others, you can actually ad adapt or change memory and learning. So that's a sort of high tech and high science future. In US, National Institute of Health is a major government funding agency that has a program called Brain Initiative. It's one of its goal is to say, can you interface to thousands and tens of thousands and million neurons? But also the connections can be imaged at the micro hi highest level of resolution uh, and also techniques of not just electrical, but magnetic and ultrasound image, uh, this. But I wanted to show this, that there is also a commercial future. Mm -hmm. What's happening is everybody recognizes Leon Musk and his company called Neuralink, and it's trying to establish this kind of brain machine interface. So we see okay. now the industry has jumped into it as well. So probably it gives you a glimpse of the future that uh, this brain machine interface is being potentially commercialized. I hope that answer helps you. There, there are more things I can say, but I hope this is inspiring. OK, so you think that we could achieve this in the future? Well, you know, I think that given these kind of commercial activities, a company like Neuralink, Control Labs, the Brain Initiative, DARPA, I don't think it's a matter of achieving. It's a more a matter of making it economic, which is what companies can do, and matter of making it more widely available, not only in very sophisticated research lab. Again, many times people say, okay, well, this is very fine if you produce or use millions of dollars to show this, but that's what happened with artificial heart and pacemaker and other things. And at some point it becomes more and more practical, more and more cost effective. Now, I don't think everyone will just go around and get a light tiny chip in the brain and will be playing games immediately. It will take decades, maybe less. You know, It took 30 years to do what we, I saw in uh, Star Trek. So we don't know. It will take years. We just don't know. But clinically, the reality is getting becoming very close. Will it be very commercial and practical? I think with this huge investment and very high-tech participation, I don't think it's as far as you can, I mean, you should be imagining, not let be held up by it. The imagination is the only limit. Creativity that would, is the only limit. That would be interesting to see that. And uh, yes, thank you, Prof. That, that was very informative. And we have another question by Dr. Adnan. What type, artificial, what type of artificial intelligence techniques being used to train the artificial arm Artificial neural network, 
deep learning, fuzzy logic, and etc. Which yeah. one is best? <laughs> well, that's the very active area of research. And now if you look at the publications, that's what people do that, right? So there are step-by-step -step processing. Each one, improved methods come, right? You have to do initially filtering. There are many methods. There are me many methods for classification. So for, you know, spectral analysis, wavelet analysis, all those. But after that, step-by-step -step machine learning techniques come up. And as I said, in the beginning, we applied recurrent neural network. And now there are many models of deep learning uh, networks. You know, of course, the deep learning has some limitation that it uh, needs a lot of training and a lot of data. So I think that deep learning techniques do absolutely work the best right now, but they also have limitation compared to some other current methods in terms of the memory, computing, training that is needed. So it's not the perfect answer for somebody who just wants to wear something and just move around, so on, right? As opposed to right now, you need big computer behind to do the processing. So I think this is an extremely active area. This is where students are doing PhD to find what is the best method. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yes, it's something that uh, uh, has to be tried out for your different application, I believe. And the people have to be inventive, right? Today, this is the opportunity for many young people to and new researchers to come in with these new machine learning and deep learning and other approaches to say, because the advances are being made not just for BMI, they're being made for speech, for face recognition and other fields. Mm -hmm. And then you can bring some of these technique into this field as well. So I think that this is an important area, but also on the other side, engineers have to build really beautiful implantable system. Surgeons have to develop a very minimally invasive techniques and it'll mm -hmm. go in parallel step by step. Okay, thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. Is there any more questions? Let's see if the viewers have any questions. We have a lot of viewers. It's going online uh, in our faculty Facebook. Well, I hope that people will, uh, you know, I just want to say, right, that neuroscience has received many Nobel Prizes. You know, this is only from 1981, right? So it's already, you can see the list of about seven, eight Nobel Prizes. They're not only nervous system related to that, but several of them in neurosciences or mm -hmm. biological sciences closer to that. There have been some Nobel Prizes that have been given to engineers for developing microscopy, which has been used for brain, this super resolution. The yeah. graphene type electrodes and materials are being now applied for neuroscience, although the pioneering work was in physics. Mm -hmm. MRI is everywhere. Computer yeah. tomography is everywhere. Uh -huh. so there are all these Nobel Prizes, so is there a kind of a noble future for this field? But what I want to show, the, my last slide, is that there is also a noble future in the sense what we're doing is useful. This person through his interface is playing piano. It's amazing. So I hope the people find this inspiration. Yeah, because you need a high precision for this to do to perform this task. There are so, so many things that go into it. Yes, but I hope that this is inspirational for people. Yes. Thank you, Prof. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time and sharing all this valuable information. We appreciate it. Earlier we had some technical problem, but it all turned out good. And um, we, I will just ask if viewers have any more questions. I guess uh, no more questions. And uh, we should uh, wrap up the session. Do you do you have an, any anything to convey to the viewers, uh, or if anyone wish to collaborate, or maybe you know want to write book together with you? I we know that you are very popular. You know. Uh, you have any contacts or anything, anyhow, we can contact you. Is it through the John Hopkins or the Singapore? Anything you'd like to share with us? I am happy to be in connection. I respond to students and professors all the time. We just have to find common interest 
and collaborative opportunities. So, okay. you know, I hope some smart young people will just say, let's, I want to do this. Can you help or can we collaborate? Let's, let's, this is the reason for your uh, lecture series to build that connection and bridges. Correct. Correct. Thank you, Prof. Thank you so much. So good night Come from on. here and have a very good day there. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Have a good day and stay safe. Uh, thanks to all viewers for joining our webinar this morning. Uh, remember, this is just one of the planned um, over 700 more waiting to be viewed by all of you. Uh, and so stay tuned with us. Please share, like our Facebook. See you again in another series. Till then, stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.